question and answer period, one of my mentors is here tonight, Bill Lopi, who I see. So I'd like to invite him up also at the end because his comments and points of view are always right on. So uh, thank you, Philip. See you later. Okay. So uh, as I was saying, when people were coming in to um, take a seat, that the first thing I want to do, and Claire, you can get ready, is just give you a little sketch of these three amazing souls who somehow, some way, survived. Some of them survived the building of the Brooklyn Bridge while the principal designer, John Rowland, didn't make it. So one of the things that I'm exploring in this book, which is almost an improbable thing to explore, is <laughs> this whole concept of genius. And part of that experience of even thinking about it comes from living in a day and age where we have somehow diminished the idea of brilliance and creativity in the culture that we live in. And for the, for the purposes of tonight, I'm not going to really pontificate about any of that because I'm just one person with my own particular experience. But what I will do is outline the three principal creators of the bridge. Now, out of the three, the father, John Augustus Roebling, was the character that I was, that I seemed to feel the most intrigued by. And one of the things uh, that I learned about him was that the man had a manic personality. He was driven. He was a driven soul. And his whole life was colored by the pursuit of endless curiosity of endless problem, uh, endless need to problem solve, an endless need to create and conquer and move to greater heights. His son, Washington Roebling, we were very lucky at some point decades ago to discover a hidden memoir, uh, a series of letters, uh, it wasn't exactly that it was hidden, it was just mysteriously misplaced, no one could find it, and uh, several decades ago they surfaced at the Rutgers University archives. Because of those documents, we had an opportunity to have more of a glimpse into the man's psyche. And for me, John Roebling was one of the most powerful, enigmatic pa uh, personalities that I've ever experienced. And his son wrote a little bit about him when he did his first major project over the Allegheny River. He wrote in building the Pittsburgh Aqueduct. I refer now more, particularly in the approaching construction of the Pittsburgh Aqueduct, in many respects, the greatest feat of his life, in my opinion, even surpassing the Niagara Bridge, mainly because it had to be accomplished in the short space of nine months during a severe winter with snow and ice in the river. It was likewise an untried problem without a precedent and, and undertaken in the face of violent opposition raised by the press by rival contractors, engineers, canal men, merchants, etc. This opposition had first to be overcome by personal effort, by, by, by contact agreement, argument, by writing in the papers and scientific journals, and by marshalling his many personal friends on his behalf. So, um, I'm going to ask Claire to read a little portion of another one of John's characteristics, his ability to believe that your mind could conquer, could conquer everything. So, okay. 
1853, nearly all workers at the bridge site were struck down by cholera, by a cholera outbreak. Washington remembered, 30 died, many escaped never to return. The workshops and boarding houses were abandoned. In one shanty lay 15 corpses. No one dared to go near the place. Finally, my father ordered all the buildings on the Canada side to be burnt, corpses and all. According to his son, Washington, Mr. Roebling would undoubtedly have been brought down by the disease as he was constantly exposed to it, had it not been for the exercise of his powerful will. He determined not to have it, but once on one occasion he walked his room all the night long, fighting against symptoms that threatened to make him its victim. Washington commented, my father had a touch of it also, but cured himself, pacing the floor all night and muttering to himself, I have it not, I have it not. <laughs> Roebling reiterated his philosophy during this period, keep off fear, this is the great secret. The, the um, entrance of Washington Roebling into the story has more to do, for me, the fascination with the concept of the firstborn son particularly people coming from European backgrounds, where family and putting the responsibilities of carrying the family's um, traditions usually go to the firstborn. Unfortunately, Washington Roebling's life was colored by a struggle, an internal struggle, a painful struggle to deal with his overbearing father. Now, in these memoirs, which I have sourced uh, repeatedly in this book, I had to take it with a grain of salt because we all know that when people write and they look back on their lives and they record certain aspects of their family relationships, it's always colored by something. But Washington Roebling turned out to be an extraordinary gifted writer. And his memories of his father really tell you so much about who he was. So one of the strongest characteristics that I began to see in Washington was that he had the grit of a survivor. And his whole childhood, even though it was colored with tragedy and torment, he somehow, over time, was, was able to overcome it for a short time when he was in the Civil War fighting as a Union soldier. So, Claire, you can go to the next one. He, his uh, Civil War memoirs, which are housed at Rutgers University, became an <coughs> enormous source of inspiration to me, an enormous source of American history. As far as I know, the memoirs are partially published, but the other parts are unpublished, but some of them, the unpublished parts, appear in this book. So Washington has these vivid accounts of what his life was like for those few years fighting, particularly at Gettysburg and Little Round Top. I rode up to Woodruff's and Cushing's batteries, where more ghastly sights met my gaze. They lost most of their horses and men. Their guns were dismounted, but they held their ground. Every moment, the sickening thud of a ball passing through a horse was heard. Neither was it an infrequent sight to see a poor beast fly to pieces from a shell exploding inside of it. Washington Roebling's greatest, greatest strength was his ability to see the job through. And how does that translate to us? It's taking your idea and in spite of your own doubts and your own phobias, your own fears, to go with it and to actually 
get to the end of the road with that idea. And when his father died in 1869, a result of his own hubris, Washington had to pick up the reins and do something that has never been done before, which is to find a way to build a bridge that only existed on paper and his father's plans, all of it untested, untried. So the kind of dynamic strength of, of belief in himself also translated in this period what he had proved to himself during the Civil War of being the dutiful soldier, of seeing the job through, only came back to benefit him in those terrible years of building the bridge. The third person in this little trilogy is his wife, Emily. And later on, we'll get into all of the uh, discussion about what I consider generic history and Wikipedia. But for our purposes here, and what I, what I took from Emily's story, knowing that so much of the record of her life was, seemed to have disappeared from the permanent record. In terms of the whole building of the Brooklyn Bridge, we know very little about her, her personal experiences, whether it be with her husband, with her child, with all the people that she had to negotiate with every day, every hour of the day. One of the things that we do know, however, is that she was a keeper of this archive that she assembled on her own, where I, I tried to imagine this, where twice a day she would clip every newspaper magazine article about the Brooklyn Bridge. It was as if she was doing this in a way to protect and defend something. It was an interesting, fascinating clue to her psychology. But perhaps the most important thing about Emily Roebling, which people, they always talk about, oh, and she, she actually did the bridge, and she you know, worked when her husband was sick. No, no, no. Her experiences of that 11-year period were, must have been so profound and so painful and so challenging that she, after the bridge was built and they moved away, she took it upon herself to become a champion for the cause of women and the pursuit of women's rights, way before the women had the right to vote. We had a woman who would go out and support all kinds of causes, give talks, and in fact, she, on her own, traveled to Europe without her husband two times on the Orient Express, wanting to reach out and learn about the world in her own way and in her own terms. One of the things about Emily that I seem to really latch on to <laughs> was that she had the stamina. I, I, we, 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 sometimes when we read history and we read things, we don't even understand, you know, you have to really stop and think that this woman got herself married, she fell madly in love with this wonderful man, and right when their relationship was starting out, her whole life changed and tumbled around her into something other than what she thought she was getting herself into. So for me, the idea of stamina, of stamina, came into the picture very profoundly. Um, the idea that you can withstand, that you can keep your vision, that you can navigate the gauntlet to do whatever it takes to get to the end zone. So, Claire, would you like to read a couple of more things? In 1899, Emily was the first woman to earn a certificate in New York University's Women's Law Class. Her final essay, A Wife's Disabilities, 
who called for the elimination of laws discriminating against women in divorce proceedings. No one denies that marriage is a contract and that a woman gives all she has to give to the man she takes as her husband. Does she not contribute largely to his success or failure in life? Must she not bear poverty and reverse of fortune with her husband when they come? And shall she not lawfully share in all the profits of his success and prosperity? Okay, Josh, we're going to head on to the pictures now. Okay. Okay, so that is a very, very, very rough sketch of who these people were. All right, so um, in these series of photographs that I'm going to show, I'm going to uh, narrate them as best as I can. Of course, this is just a small selection from the book, but I thought I would start with some of my early photographs of the bridge. And one of the things that I want you to see here that uh, came very apparent to me when I was going back into my archives was I want you to notice the ice here. Okay, you see the little ice flow in the junk car? Well, that was the last time we saw ice on the East River. And the reason that it struck me that I really wanted to include this photograph in the book is that we have to think that 100 years ago, I mean at the time before the bridge was even built, that the ice on the East River was so severe and so dense that people could not go back and forth from Brooklyn. And that was, in fact, the catalyst, the final catalyst, in the decision to go ahead with trying to get a bridge built from Brooklyn to Manhattan. So the ice became a real factor in people's lives. The winters were so severe. And for us, I mean, it's, it's, it's a century later. And look at what has changed. Look at how the world has changed, where this is it. And since I photographed this, since I took this picture in 1980, there's never been any more ice that, have, that has gone this far out into the river. So it's really something to think about Right. And again, from this period in the early 80s, we can see the, my bridge, you know, by the waterfront. And uh, for me, I was always down by the river. And this was at the, around the same time that I started doing my work down on South Street. So that was kind of part of the same period. So. Um, and again, you know, we can look at these pictures and start arguing for urban development and renewal and parks and whatever, but I wanted to share this photograph with you because over time, the bridge became a real source of inspiration to me, as I said in the beginning, and I was mostly just reacting every day or every week to some new physical occurrence on the river. Things started to change for me in uh, 1999 when all of a sudden this work crew showed up outside my windows and the Brooklyn Bridge itself on the Manhattan side was in need of a fix, said all the newspapers. They were starting to run articles on how the ramp, the, the roadway was falling down, it needed to be refurbished. So on my regular route back and forth, I noticed one day that this door in the approach, which is the stone structure that is built onto, leads off from the bridge itself, was open. And also one of the things about this photograph is that it almost reminded me of a, a tomb. It had this tomb-like quality to it where you're getting a little glimpse of something you, that has been hidden in secret for all these years. So over a period of months, I had to lobby the city, who were, was very reluctant, whoops, but very reluctant to let me inside. And the reason being, it wasn't until I really got in there that I understood 
why I had to sign all these waivers and promise not to go to the press with any of these photographs. So I promised. But now it's a few years later, and <laughs> here we are. And I want you to see that for me, this was really the beginning of a of a curiosity. Like, how, what, what, what is going on with this bridge? I mean, it was like, besides being so beautiful on the outside, all of a sudden, I'm inside, mm -hmm. and it's a whole different experience. And from different periods in history, in its own history, you could see the comings and goings of work crews, of people piddling around in there. But yet again, it was still a mystery to me. And all through the bridge, I would see these weird jars of soil samples, and they were labeled. And after going through the history of the building of the Brooklyn Bridge, I know that Washington Noblin took extensive soil samples all the time to test the levels of, of his excavation. So all of these little, little things that I would notice in there became objects of fascination. And uh, this is probably one of the more seminal pictures. It's um, from 50 feet under the main street level. And in the book, I describe my experiences as a photographer climbing down these ladders and being in situations where, you know, you're, an accident could very easily happen. And one thing about these interior spaces was that I didn't at the time know what they were used for because John Roebling had designed them. They were, they were initial designs that he incorporated when he was conceiving of the bridge. So what were they for? Why did he, why did he create them? And why was it that each space uh, I don't know. These clickers. That that each space was uh, individually different from the other. Um, this photograph shows the the main entrance of the tunnel, and through the whole experience of being inside. There were tunnels leading in all different directions. Some of them were walled off. This is the one that happened to go to the outside on Pearl Street. And I almost got locked in one weekend. <laughs> so that was pretty scary. But the whole idea of being inside the bridge led me to more questions. Like, what were these spaces used for? Who worked there? Because they obviously had vestiges of of human uh, contact. So, I'm sorry. So, the next part of my journey led me to the archives. There are two archives that house the Roebling collection. One is at RPI in Troy, New York, where Washington went to school and then, mistake, you know, out of tradition, sent his son John, who in the end decided not to be an engineer. But the other archive, which we have Fernanda here tonight, is it held at Rutgers University, their family collection. And I had done repeated visits there because I was so intrigued. But initially, when I went there, I tried to get information about the inside of the bridge, and I came up with nothing. But what I did come up with was something far greater and far more interesting than anything I could have anticipated. Because for the first time, I, I had the experience of seeing a man so brilliant and so curious and so unabashedly wanting to reach great heights. I, I was overwhelmed. And when Fernanda allowed me to photograph and she locked me into these secure rooms with the Roebling notes, I felt like I was, I was really in the presence of some of greatness. You know, and you don't know what that greatness is. It's, it's like you just know it when you see it, when you feel it. 
And that's what I've been struggling with for years, you know, is to try and figure out what, what is it about people, what is it about their, their drive, their compassion, their curiosity, their, their desire, what makes people go to these <coughs> lengths to do work that is meaningful, that can possibly maybe change the way we envision the world. And that's a big tall order and it and it can be very um it can be very humbling. But nevertheless, I needed to be with him and to experience a little of that. So one of the uh, you know, out of the archives, this came from Mulhausen. This is his uh, a fascinating document on his trip over to America. John Roebling wrote about everything. He, he wanted to record every day of his voyage, which took 10 weeks, which was longer than the voyage of Christopher Columbus. And in... Really? Yeah, 10 weeks. They were on boot sea for 10 weeks. And in, on that voyage is when he actually, and you'll read in the book, I mean, he, he had to get his, his he, he had to get involved in every aspect of the ship sailing. And including, <laughs> he was very compassionate to the people in steerage. And at the time, the people in steerage had to go off the side of the boat. So he devised a little toilet system for them so that they wouldn't have to risk their lives if the boat shaped. <laughs> <laughs> this is the kind of detail that he got into. Um, and another thing in the archives at Rutgers is that he he has, he has, if any of you go and visit, it's a fascinating experience. He has like these pages of blue line notebooks where he talks about the spiritual world, the natural world, the meaning of God. And here is, must have been a little mantra that he had on paper that says, one God, one universe, one, one love. One God, one universe, one love. And he just keeps writing it over and over again. Even David McCullough was defeated by these pages, but I, I, I had to put one in because you have to see this. It's just page after page after page of trying to understand how the universe ticks. <laughs> so this became for me a source of real intrigue because uh, one of the things I did not want to do in this book was to rehash anything anyone else had ever done about the Brooklyn Bridge, which meant showing the same drawings or the same pictures, even of my own photographs, anything that even looked like somebody else's picture, no matter how good it was, out, out, out. So this, I love this, this drawing because it's just, a little sketch, a little scrawl, and what he is doing here is giving you for the first time a little sense of what would be called the East River Bridge. So there it was in his little pocket-sized notebook, and you can see here the first genesis of his ideas, you know, and he's trying to figure out the diagonals and tower and how far are we going here and here. You know, and, and again, uh, being a visual artist, I, I always cling on to the drawings because that gives you a window into one's... The drawings, the sketches are imperative if you're going to understand the mind of an artist or the mind of a creative person. And one of the things that is quite obvious as we continue on <laughs> with talking about Mr. Rowan, who I could just talk about for hours because he was such an intriguing character. But one of the things that he did 
similar to Leonardo da Vinci, was that he developed his, <coughs> his notebooks, his the theme of having notebooks where all his ideas were recorded became part of his real oof. A lot of his ideas, things that never even became reality, somehow, some way, found their way into the notebooks, only to be discovered later. So after a period of time, I knew I had to go to Germany to kind of retrace his roots and see what I could find. And one of the things about this photograph, I believe I showed this in class, <coughs> is that the, uh, a contemporary artist did a statue of him in the main town square. And what really struck me, it's a very tiny town, and it's a walled, ancient, medieval town, was his fix staring at his church, which is the Dibby Blasius church, which is just a stone's throw from his family house, and how in the center of town, how this church could have, I, I hate to use the word inspired, because I think that word is kind of like, doesn't really say it, by osmosis, by the experience of our immediate surroundings, we take in certain things, whether it be consciously or unconsciously. And this beautiful church, which had uh, its origins in uh, the year 1100, is an example of the Gothic churches of that period. So um, the town square <coughs> and this particular photograph, I thought was important was important to um, to show. So um, the other thing is it's a little side story, but the part of the experience of being in Mulhausen and the Divi Blasius Church, where John Roebling was baptized and and apparently, you know, lived so close in proximity to, was that it was also. Um, a place where Bach got one of his first gigs as an organist. And um, uh, the amazing thing about going to Mulhausen, to the archives there, was that down uh, all of these stone stairs to the basement, which used to serve as a debtor's prison, they had his original cantatas that he composed there. And you have to remember he was very poor, very unknown, nobody knew about, you know, he was just happy to have a job. And there were these beautiful cantatas. And this is part of the duck soup that Roebling was born into, a period, there was a period in Germany where some of the greatest thinkers and artists came from this area. So getting back to um, Mulhausen, one of the things about this early, this early discovery was that I started reading books and one of the first books that everybody reads is D.B. Steinem. And he was an engineer who refurbished, worked on refurbishing the bridge in the 1960s. But he also had a secret desire to be a screenwriter. So he took the genealogy of the Roebling family and most likely embellished a little of it. And as a result, he brought my focus of attention to this concept of walls in the wall town and the di dichotomy <clears throat> of diametrically opposed personalities of Roblin's parents, whereas the father was very passive. He was someone who had no need to be curious. Father was a tobacco trader. And the mother hated her life. She was a very intense person, very volatile, very bright, very uh, self self-reliant, and somehow, some way, it was the mother who managed probably to embezzle money from the tobacco <laughs> business, save it, and get her kid the hell out of Mulhouse, <laughs> which is what she did. And she sent him away to be tutored in Erfurt by a very famous professor, Dr. Unger, who introduced John to the world of Greek, of of, of the Greek antiquities and the importance of mathematics, the importance of drawing. So, this part of the story is very important because the walls became for me, in my book, a metaphor 
for something either you have freedom or you are blocked in. It's a, it's a philosophy. Do you want to feel secure or do you want to be challenged by getting out? And all around the town that you walk, you just see these wall fragments. They're, they're everywhere. And this photograph shows you, I was totally surprised that when I finally found Roebling's birthplace, which is right around the corner from the church, it was in this old storefront, totally nondescript. There's no, there's a little plaque over here. And again, it was very striking to me as an American, you know, coming from, coming off of this great myth of the Brooklyn Bridge, and there you are, and someone was living here in Frederica's kitchen. So it was a very strange experience and encounter for me. So, uh, okay. Yes, and then some of the local architecture, uh, just so for all of you out there who try and understand that in America we knock everything down, that this tanning factory from the 1700s was now being used as a residential dwelling, as is. Um, the last part of this part, of, uh, the last part of the sequence about Germany was that um, everybody talks about how John Roebling was um, inspired by Hegel, that he was his favorite student, that he would have tea in the parlor. The most important thing to know that John Roebling, when he went to the University of Berlin, was caught up in what was at that time a real revolution of thinking. And Hegel became one of the first philosophers who spouted what would be called the supremacy of reason. And what that all meant after people have studied Hegel for decades and centuries was that he imbued, he invoked in John this idea, whether you agreed with it or not, that you must trust in your own ideas, your own opinions. Screw everybody else. Screw it all. You must trust yourself. And then, of course, he extrapolated to what is freedom and Europe and the old armory and you've got to go to America. So it kind of set him off on a trajectory because during his student years, as prolific as he was, as creative as he was, which you see in the book, all these amazing proposals, including a bridge over the English Channel and a bridge over the Rhine River, and nothing ever saw the light of day because Europe was very bureaucratic and no one wanted to, new ideas and innovation were, were frightening to the old god, to the aristocracy, aristocracy, to the people who only wanted to keep things as a status quo. So Hegel was a blessing and a curse because a kind of, according to David McCullough, but we'll never know for sure, that this thinking set him off on a path of being iron-willed and cold and uh, unemotional and, according to Washington Roebling, uh, a, 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 a brute with his family, you know, someone that tortured them and beat them and starved them. So we don't know. The facts are that Hegel was brilliant. His own backstory is enough to talk for hours. But Somehow, some way, he influenced this young man who eventually changed the face of American technology. And um, I'm going to, because of the, I'm going to uh, now speed this up a little bit. <laughs> so, <laughs> because of the time. But um, these drawings, these photographs that I did later on were based on some of John Roebling's drawings. So I would go and study them. This one is not in the book, but I, it caught my eye. It was at RPI. And I would go up on the bridge and start deconstructing it by interpreting his drawings. So this photograph that I took from the tower kind of, uh, in my own mind, 
you know, mimics that drawing, the way he laid out these, uh, the stays. These are the stays, these are diagonal stays, which you can see on the bridge. Um, one of the challenges of putting this project together was marrying some of this mis historical material with what I consider to be image and memory. It's something, of course, filmmakers do all the time. And so when I got to the point where I wanted to talk about John's immigration to America and his struggles, his early struggles, set in creating this wilderness colony in Saxonburg in, in Western Pennsylvania, I had to look for locations that were based on or similar to so finding this beautiful spot where you try to get, give people the sense of the wilderness of, you know, was part of the challenge of putting this book together so that when you read the story, you can look at the picture and just try and imagine being on that journey with him. Or for that matter, with me, because I'm on this journey of discovery. And um, so some of his early projects had to do, and this is very important because this is where people get all confused about John Roebling and his contribution to America, that he did not invent wire rope. He didn't invent the cables for the Brooklyn Bridge. In fact, he was an avid reader, and in the beginnings of his experiences in, uh, in the New World, he was desperate for work, and like all artists, he had to network, he had to reach out, he had to find all kinds of ways to seek employment after he started a family and got married. So something back in American history, which I never knew about, was the Portage Railroad. And this was important because all of us here in New York had to keep warm in the winter. So they couldn't figure out ways to get the coal and the anthracite from Pennsylvania back to the Hudson River, so they had to devise all these canals and river systems and up and down from these slopes. So he got a job surveying for one of the Portage Railroads in Pennsylvania. And one day, the hemp ropes would pull the rail cars up the mountain and then down again and then back to the canals and then back out to the river. The hemp rope broke, going back and two two men got crushed and died. And all of a sudden, well not all of a sudden, but somehow he recalled reading about this miner in the Hartz Mountains in Germany who started talking about making rope out of wire. So he got really excited about that idea and at the same time started reaching out to other people who were experimenting with wire rope. The thing that I loved about John Roebling, as I said before, was that he was always coming up with new inventions and during this period when he was uh, active, actively looking for work and actively um, inventing things, this is a page from his notebook from Rutgers where you see him inventing a steam locomotive. And you could see the precise drawings, his precise hand, and his beautiful penmanship. And here, this is the last photograph I took on the Brooklyn Bridge, and this is about as technical as I'll get tonight. But you can see these are called the stays, and this is the diagonal cables that come down from the tower. So you can see here all the individual <coughs> strands of wire. And that, my friends, changed American technology forever. We found that afterwards in everything from um, uh, everything from airplanes, nautical equipment, elevators, construction derricks, anything that we attribute to building the America of the 18 and 1900s came out of this in, this manufactured product. And these are all of John Roebling's early projects because as an artist, you don't just come up with your grand idea. It's a process. You, you take steps. Every step is a step in the next direction 
to a greater and bigger idea. And many people don't know anything about his early projects. And this is why I, I, I know um, the other two characters in our story. I don't want to give them short shrift, but there's so much to say about this man that it's so compelling. So uh, this is one of his last surviving aqueducts, which is now turned into a roadway. And you can see these fingers coming out into the river. Well, those are icebreakers. And he designed those because the Delaware River gets so frozen that in order for the, um, uh, this was a way of breaking up the ice so that it wouldn't, so that you could have passageway. These photographs here, this series of pictures which, which uh, I took in Saxonburg are humorous and funny because I went there in search of John Roebling's house, his first home in the New World. And what I found instead was no sense of history and just a collection. You can read it in the book. It's a collection of artifacts that were hidden away in a closet. But basically, um, uh, what we consider to be history and the historical record somehow, somehow got um, dissipated in this experience. Again, here are some of his early projects over the Never Sink. And Hidden Away is another aqueduct in High Falls. It, it I had a photograph surviving. on private property. What? It doesn't look like it's surviving like the other. No, no, because they're hidden. They're, they're discarded. <coughs> this brilliant man's early work, once it did not have use anymore, somehow got lost. What state is that? That's in upstate New York, High Falls, New York. I'm going to skip over to Washington Roebling and talk a little bit about his experiences, <coughs> as I said, in the Civil War. Um, some of the most important photographs in this book I took on Little Round Top in Pennsylvania, Gettysburg, because it's apparently he was very instrumental in helping change the direction of that, of the Civil War, by being somehow involved in the protecting of Little Round Top against the Confederate Army. So going there, it was a real challenge to uh, find the lo exact locations which I narrate in the book, and then finding a new way to bring those battlefields to life. And uh, this photograph, as you read the book, what's so interesting to me about living history was that when Washington met Emily Roebling, it was at a military ball in Virginia. And once they connected with each other and it seemed like they had this very, very, very romantic interlude where lots of letters went back and forth between them. And in the letter, and in the letter, because I don't, I don't want to lose it, what was so amazing is that I had to find, in the, in the letter to Emily, when Matthew Brady came to take picture of their battery, their, their, uh, their group, he was camera shy because he looked so disheveled and he was so exhausted that he stayed out of the picture. So the most amazing thing was to find the photograph that he was referring to, which was in the Library of Congress. <coughs> and you can see, because I know what he looks like. Uh, is that the projector? Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, OK, that he is not in the photograph. So that's. <laughs> and uh, I get into talking about the uh, Cincinnati Bridge a little bit, because Washington was sent there immediately after he got married. His father, once he left the uh, Civil War and the freedom of being away from his father, he was pulled back into the fold because the Cincinnati Bridge was being constructed. And his father, by that time, was getting ready 
to design the Brooklyn Bridge, so he left Washington, who by this time, because he was around his father his whole life, learned more about engineering than, than, his, um, than his father. Um, I put these two photographs together to make you understand that this was the longest suspension bridge when it was built and the most sturdy. And during the flood of 1937, the Roebling Bridge in Cincinnati was the only one that was left standing for a thousand miles. And you can see this is a this is my photograph on the left, and the one on the right is from the archive. And uh, as we continue through the story, we, we get to learn a little bit more about the rise of capitalism in America and who these cast of characters were that financed the bridge projects. And uh, this is interesting. It's from the archives, and it's a letter that Washington wrote to his brother Ferdinand when his father falls down from his position on top of the pier and jams his foot and has to have his toes amputated. So this little note, this Western Union telegram <laughs> written in 1869 says, his toes were cut off, but his foot is still there. <laughs> and again, it makes history very palpable and very real. And, um, Getting to the, the heart of Washington's story, what I wanted to portray for people so that they'd really understand what this man was all about, was that he was confronted with the most major horrendous decisions that any human being could ever deal with in their lifetime. And while he had to build the Brooklyn Bridge, the biggest, as you've probably read before, the biggest challenge was to find a way to sink all the way to the bottom of the river these foundations that had to be so strong to suspend a bridge over a river of that distance. So I did these series of photographs knowing that underneath this water is where the caissons are actually situated, but you'll never see them. They're hidden for all eternity. And what I had to do in the book was to show people, this is a, a drawing that's attributed to Washington Roebling, although I'm still not convinced that it, that it was only his hand. It may have been, it might have been one of his assistants, William Hildebrand, who was a brilliant um, uh, draftsman. But you can see here that in this drawing, again, going back to the drawings, where he has figured out each level of sediment, right, and how you had to sink to the bottom this giant inverted box on which the stone towers would rest. And as you kept building overhead, the box would sink to the bottom. And I put this one in because I thought it was a very interesting thing between father and son, and that is, John Roebling's precision and his, his ability to render detail, both in his head and with the, with the pen, went in stark difference to his son, who was basically very conceptual and would understand and, and uh, create his own inventions and designs, this time having to do with finding a new way to get the um, debris from the bottom of the caisson back up to the top. So you can see one is scribbling and configuring something out, and the other one is totally, totally deliberately planning each line. And um, so I uh, was very intrigued after reading the whole horrible story of the New York Tower in which so many men lost their lives closer to my side was somehow both magnificent and at the same time malicious because in order to get this built, the challenge of sinking the foundations to a depth of the river that was 
way deeper than it was on the Brooklyn side, not only took the lives of many of these workers, but this is what really sealed the deal for Washington when he really became ill with the so-called bends, which by that time changed the traje trajectory of his life and that of his wife, Emily. Um, another factor to the story, which you will read about, is the role the role of Emily Roblin's brother, General Warren, who was Washington Roblin's senior during the Civil War. And the reason that he is such a compelling figure is because, again, a tremendously brave, courageous, brilliant general in charge of the Engineering Corps, in charge of all these different strategies to win in Gettysburg. And what happened is, during the war, as in every walk of life, there were jealous generals, different levels of confidence. So towards the end of the Civil War, the last campaign, they accused him of some malfeasance and stripped him of his title as general. And he died in not only uh, feeling that he was a broken man, but a broken spirit. So, and it wasn't until later, posthumously, did they erect a sca statue to him at Gettysburg. And the reason his, his role in Emily's life was so important is that she had not only the love of her life, being a broken man, but also her brother. And I really feel that that was further impetus for her to protect and defend that she didn't want to see what happened to her brother, happened to her husband. So during the years that he got ill, she picked up this, somehow gathered the strength to somehow find a way to keep this project going, albeit in secret, covert, no one really knew that she was the liaison between all these different people that were needed to keep the bridge project going. And the, as I said in the beginning of the talk, that for me, the most important things about Emily was not so much what she did. We all know that she kept the project going. That's been written about everywhere. But it's what she did afterwards with her life. And the fact that she became such a, a, a force for the rights of women and to find a way in her own life to define herself and what her role was, what her role was to be, was not just to be a woman of the Gilded Age, albeit she had to confine to being silent, to not registering her opinions in public, but slowly on her own, she was able to get active in all these different committees to help women and children. And you can read about it in the book. Her life was nothing other than remarkable. And, and one of her greatest contributions for all of us is the fact that without her ability to create this archive, we wouldn't have the record that we have today of the Brooklyn Bridge. We just wouldn't. And so the question is, what was that about? Why did she do it? And these are some of my uh, photographs that are in the portfolio. As I said before, if there's any photographs there that would look like anything, I would just throw them out. So. <laughs> This is a priest store in Mulhausen. I mean, it's a, it's a no-brainer. I mean, you can see the Gothic influence. You know, it's easy. <laughs> and um, again, I would I like to shoot from my roof. <laughs> With a mysterious piano. And just to end the talk, I was in Italy over the summer where I was uh, there to <laughs> supervise the printing of this book. So 
I had the great experience of being in Loreto, Italy, at one of the last surviving places where craftsmen still work at making beautiful objects. So while I was there, they were working on a book about Michelangelo for the Pope. <laughs> so I had Christian put this up, and they have a little printing museum there. It's tiny. And, you know, I took that picture. And so you could just see the level of concern people have still for bookmaking, which is really good. <laughs> and that's my picture looking out from the Divi Blasi's church. The end. Thank you. Okay, so we have, besides, we have Philip Lope here and Fernanda Perot. <coughs> and I, I hope we can pepper them with questions so I don't have to talk so much. Okay, so we have a great writer and a great curator, and we have the artist. So. Okay, questions, comments? <coughs> yes? Uh, did you say there was a brother, John, who did not become an engineer? There was um, the son of Washington oh. Roebling was also, uh, I'm going to stand, uh, was also sent to RPI, but he knew he, he couldn't run the gauntlet and never became, never became an engineer. So, so what did he do? Uh, he got into business, some kind of family, you know, they, they had a big wire rope mill, so he worked in that capacity, but by that time they started selling off the company. I mean, he didn't have to work. I mean, yeah. By that time, the family was very wealthy. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Questions, comments? Uh, um, did Washington have a brother? No, he was an um, oh, only child. I apparently Emily had a fall. Um, and uh, did Washington have a brother? You mean Washington Roebling? Yes. You know, we're not talking. His brothers, <coughs> Charles and Ferdinand ran the company after John, the father John, died. John's brothers. Yeah. So the, the point is, is that Washington always carried a grudge because he was the first born and his father put all that pressure on him to become the engineer. Yes. Sometimes um, the story is that um, Washington is at 110 Columbia, you know, the, the, the Brownstone, yeah. and, and Emily is doing the liaison, which you did. And I could only imagine that your photographs kind of capture some of that, as she's watching it grow, and she gets the essence of it. And sometimes they even speculate that she has some technical uh, abilities. You know, she didn't get, later on she gets more education, but um, but we got to compliment you on the photographs that seem to capture the essence of, of that dynamic. Thank you. But one of the things that I, I really, that has been on my mind since we're in this dark period, and that, and I, and I really think this is important, the, the concept of the historical record and what it is that we read, because in my experience of putting this book together, I kept reading the same things over and over again, the same facts, whether they be correct or partially correct or not investigated enough. And I'd like to know what both of you think about that. Well, it's obvious that <coughs> books feed on other books and then they often uh, keep these uh, half facts alive. Um, I want to say something about uh, my experience with Barbara where um, when, I was writing, when I was writing my book, Waterfront, I, I heard about Barbara and, uh, and wanted to sneak into the innards of the Brooklyn Bridge. And, uh, and uh, so I called her up and, and we did this more or less like a belly flop. Uh, we had to crawl in there quite illegally, I think, at that oh, point. Yeah. Yeah. It was quite illegal. But then a lot of my research for the Waterfront turned out to be quite illegal. But anyway, uh, <laughs> that's part of the story of the waterfront that they didn't want to let people get to to the edge. But uh, so we, we, we crawled in there and it, and it was probably uh, 
uh, a feast for insurance companies in that we could have broken our legs, ankles at any point. Uh, but it, it interested me that some of those, um, those uh, lofted spaces uh, had, been, had been rented out shortly after the bridge was open to butchers, to what else was in there? It was uh, maritime uh, junk, refrigerators, tanneries, storage, I storage, think. storage, and, and one of the things <coughs> that uh, I, I, because of time, you know, I was speeding through, but in the, in, what we discovered at the municipal archives and the rent rolls was that there were all these businesses, including one, oh, there was a winery there. Yeah. Which winery I makes been, sense, yeah. You know, <laughs> but initially, and I found this in the report to the engineers uh, for the Brooklyn Bridge in the first report, that John Roebling envisioned these spaces, the Anchorage spaces, as treasury vaults for Wall Street. <laughs> and that he wanted these spaces to be used for the bankers to store all the gold in America <laughs> and keep it secure. So that kind of makes sense if you have these tunnel-like spaces that went from this place to that place to this place. I think it's interesting because, you know, uh, we're, all, we're always faced with this situation now of public-private uh, collaboration with things like the Brooklyn Bridge Park. Uh, and we think that that's a, a recent corruption, but it turns out that even even then, they thought we, they, we need to bring in some money from this public works. You know? yeah. yes. So, is there any current movement to rent that space out and use it commercially? Or you, to on, in Brooklyn, of course, the Brooklyn side, they have the anchorage, which they sometimes use as a gallery. Right? Yeah. Yeah. And and it's it's very well, because of the security, nothing has been done. Uh, but um, but uh, I'm starting to hear talk that they might be doing something on the new. Side. But the point is that what was important for me to know about the inside of the bridge was that it was like I was going into the belly of the beast and there was a sense, and it still is like this, that the inside of the bridge was totally derelict, totally hidden, totally secret. The only people that ever were in there were the homeless for a long period of time. And yet they were designed to be on the par of Europe, like these grand bridges in Florence, all these places of commerce, and yet it somehow worked for a while, and then after <coughs> World War II, it seemed to fall into some kind of um, disintegration. Yeah, when we were exploring it, uh, the, the, the area around uh, the Brooklyn Bridge, uh, right in front, was, was just a garbage dump, basically. It was amazing that this, you know, work that's sometimes called one of the great uh, works of art of the, of the 19th century in America was, was allowed to <coughs> deteriorate to that degree. deteriorate like that. And, and again, what does this say about us? Um, but for me, one of the things that I discovered, because I was forced to do research mm -hmm. and watching Philip during his Waterfront book and accompanying him, trying to find answers to some of these questions, that, for me, was a big change in my life. And we have another photographer here, my colleague, Andrew Garn, we were talking before. Perhaps you want to say something about the role of artists and photographers now and why they sometimes have to be forced to do research in a way that we never thought we had to do before? I think you have to bring the story to life. And you have to be able to... You speak loud? I think you have to be able to bring the visual story to life and you have to add words to it to add to your audience. Otherwise, it just gets lost. And I think a lot of people are not so interested in the pictures, but they want to know the backstory. Right. Mm -hmm. Yes, and I think, I think one of the great things about this project was it forced Barbara to do much more writing than she ever wanted to do before. <laughs> <laughs> How many words are in the book? I'm just curious. <laughs> the, the little jars that you showed, the salt sums, are they somewhere in the archives? Yeah, what happened to them? I don't know. It's still there, probably. Are the inside still kind of? Uh, yeah, they cleaned it out, but it's still it's still there. Anyway. It looks like some of that would have gone to a museum. Yeah, I thought so too. I don't know. They they kicked me out after a certain period of time. Yes. So uh, I want to pick up on uh, the beautiful photograph you took of the cable, and you were talking about what a monumental 
scientific breakthrough that was. But can you comment? My recollection is, and I'm not trying to get into the engineering, no, we but we have John Roebling designed the cable, as I recall, but then there was a, a screw up on the materials that were supplied, and they had a remediation on the cable, and what we were looking at was actually the fix of the screw up, was it not? Yeah, they had to replace um, some of the stuff that's not good quality. Yeah, well, what happened was Tweed, Tweed uh, pocketed some of the money for, for the, uh, the bridge, uh, but fortunately they had, they had um, overcompensated. What's the word? Redundant? Uh, yeah, no, they uh, had to overcompensate. And so, and so it still was, 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 was able to stand, but, a lot of the, but there was a lot of uh, rake-offs, you might say. Did, did, did not the final wrap on the cable come from Trenton, from the Roebling factory? Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I just want to add something which is even more important, okay? And this is like a philosophical thing, that you can't trust anyone. Not only, you have to only trust yourself. And one of the things that the father always told the son that after he got over his romance with America, he understood that America was based on greed and capitalism. So the father had a whole, and that's why I had that picture up of him and um, Schinkel on this Cincinnati Bridge, which you'll read about in the book. It's fascinating and hilarious. But the father and the son both knew that something like this could happen that if they didn't get the contract, which they didn't, to, to use their own steel wire on the Brooklyn Bridge, that someone else was going to do it and they were going to screw it up. They were going to try and make money by supplying inferior cable, which is what happened. And this whole thing had to be covered up. And yes, Boss Tweed was part of the initial early graft on the bridge, but this was a thing that the father passed on to the son in America. Capitalism and greed is going to get you. So that's what that story was about. We had another hand over that. Didn't we? Yeah, go. Uh, the bridge in its origin obviously was for, in 1875, a uh, horse and wagon, I yeah. presume, mostly. Um, did the walking path, which is so popular today, exist then? Yes, yeah. it did. When and it did, opened, they, there were a lot of people did they ever have a trolley or a subway go through there like? Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. And in fact, one of the most amazing films was done by Thomas Edison. Yeah. It's on all the blogs and everything. And the you early, go on a train ride film, yeah. over the bridge. It's like amazing. Mm -hmm. but. The thing that, for me, that became such an important part of the story was doing research. And not every artist and every photographer on the surface seems to be of that ilk. But really, in order to think about an idea and really carry it forward, there has to be some back thinking there. Where is this idea coming from? Well, where can I extrapolate from this, 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 and that? And the idea of, of having an archive, of having a keeper of these facts and these records was something I had not experienced so far in my creative journey, which is why I wanted to ask Fernanda, what is that like when you have all these people that show up at the archives looking for things and then inadvertently they write things that aren't true or that, that they don't get right or can you talk a little bit about your experience as a curator of an archive? Sure. Well we have researchers from all over the world using their Roblin uh, papers in, including Australia. I, there was one guy from New South Wales and I realized he was like two hours from the nearest public library. <laughs> so we had the collection is microfilmed, so we actually lent him the microfilm and he had to go and stay um, stay near this public library so he could use the microfilm. Um, but I mean I have to like kind of let go of it that some people um, 
will publish things which are really not very good. Um, you know, there have been a number of, of books about uh, the Roblings and about the Brooklyn Bridge, and some, some of them are better than others. And as Barbara said, um, and as Philip said, people will keep repeating the same, um, you know, the same kind of half-truths, particularly if it's somebody doing like a more superficial type of thing. And there's everything, like there's things for children, um, there's like all levels of, you know, people are interested in the Roblings at all levels of like the highest, you know, most uh, scholarly to the most sort of pedestrian every day. But um, I think too, there's, people want to make it into a better story, like a more romantic story. Like Barbara had mentioned that D.B. Steinman had a, like, <laughs> A fantasy of becoming a filmmaker, and like his his writing is like very dramatic, and but the reality is like we don't really know. I think Emily or her son at some point somebody destroyed a lot of her papers. Yes. We do have some of her letters from later in her life, uh, like when she goes to Russia, and but we don't really know what was going on at the time. We know that. Washington was incapacitated. We have maybe one, a few documents that kind of, sh where he's written things on a piece of paper, and you realize that it was for her to take to meet with the um, the people, the engineers, and the workmen at the br at the bridge site. And we know that um, at one point they're they're talking because this took a long. I mean, it took years to build the bridge. You talk about like a project that's way over budget, that's over like running way over time. They, they talked about dismissing Washington, and she actually had to go and meet with them and convince them, you know, that he was capable of doing the job. My, my understanding is that it was a combination of, of the bends and mental illness. I think so. I think this, he definitely had the bends, but I think it was also the stress of, of this huge project that. Nobody knew if it was, would really work. Um, of course, it was, as Barbara said, it was all involved with New York politics of the Tammany Hall um, of the period and people, you know, people being, um, getting killed at the bridge site. You know, it was just, it was this huge undertaking. So I think it, it did, um, and I think he even acknowledged it. If you, if you look at some of his writings, you know, it was partly mental. Uh, yes. uh, stress, and that was, and I think stress also exacerbates the, sim the symptoms of case on disease mm. as well. So, if um, there's obviously an endless amount of information right. and interest and ideas um, to discuss here, and we do have a reception, we can continue asking individual questions, but um, let me just try to um, wrap back into itself the ideas that were just being uh, discussed here, because the idea of a, of a museum, the mission of a museum, is collect, preserve, and interpret. Uh, and as you were saying, the archives preserves. Um, the, hopefully the museum will interpret in a broad context. Uh, but without the creators, there wouldn't be any reason to have museums. And so thank you, Barbara, for um, tracing the creation of the, of the bridge, but also contributing your beautiful work to reporting. Uh, you who haven't been here before, I'm the founder, director, and curator of the museum. Um, how many people are, I see a lot of familiar faces, but how many people are here for the first time tonight? Great, welcome. So I'm delighted that you found out from Barbara or whomever uh, about our book talk series. We have every, uh, at least once a month and sometimes more uh, an author talk about her or his book uh, on topics that are broadly about <coughs> New York City history, skyscrapers, urbanism around the world, contemporary history and contemporary. So, um, and we have a devoted uh, following of authors who uh, kindly share their, their work and their knowledge with the museum. 
And um, Barbara is now entering into the level of the two peats of speakers because just last December 5th, I just looked oh. it up on the uh, on um, our website, and you can hear her talk about this book, uh, South Street, the one that she already made reference to, uh, which is a collection of her photographs of the the streets of South Street Seaport and also the workers, the the, um, the workers fish mongers and uh, yeah the incredible um, uh, waterfront working the working waterfront of New York that was a part of an exhibition that we did last year called Millennium Lower Manhattan in the 1990s uh, and. Barbara preceded her, her photographs, uh, and there's one in the corner back there on the red wall where you can see one of her, um, one of her beautiful prints uh, as part of this exhibition, Skyline, which I'll talk about in just in very briefly in just a moment. Um, so Barbara preceded the, the focus of that exhibition on the uh, years just before the turn of the 20th century and the either auspicious or inauspicious uh, history of Lower Manhattan at the time just before 9-11. And so we, in our, our focus on that, that very small period, um, we wanted to do a kind of deep dive into the history of downtown uh, in uh, the last years of the 20th century. And in this exhibition, that I hope you'll take some time to look at either after the talk or, or come back, Skyline, uh, we have looked very broadly at almost 150 years worth of the high-rise development of New York. And I want to draw your attention, because you can see it back in that corner, to the uh, panorama, actually three panels of the panorama from the Brooklyn Bridge before it was strung with its cables by Joshua Beale, um, dating from eight, uh, 1876, uh, a photograph, an incredible photograph that's in the collection of the uh, New York uh, Public Library and uh, only in about five or six copies that we know of uh, in, in other repositories, a couple in a private collection. And the actual photograph, which was taken with glass plate negatives with the equipment that Beale um, carried by leg and hand up to the top of the bridge, uh, the, the Brooklyn Tower of the bridge, to look across and capture one of the pho first photographic views of the skyline of Lower Manhattan as it began to ascend into the vertical. Um, because that was just the period before elevators began to enable skyscrapers or high-rise buildings, especially office buildings, and uh, to begin the progression that we show in this exhibition of the changing scale um, of, the, of the New York skyline. So photography plays uh, the central role in this, in the history that we um, are trying to record of the New York skyline and its ascent. So um, Barbara fits into this documentary aspect of the museum's uh, mission um, in important ways from her own experience. And in this book, she really looks back at history too and begins um, in that cliched trope, a, a journey, literally, you know, her journey of being a photographer by including in this book too a real journey to the places, the sources of um, the Roebling's first work, of their uh, their lineage in Europe. And that's what some of what you'll see in this uh, in the, the lecture tonight and in the book that I hope you'll buy. Um, um, we'll, we'll have copies here in a reception and a, a signing after the talk. Uh, and that's one thing that makes uh, this book really extraordinary beside Barbara's extraordinary photographs, um, the marrying of the archival sources and the archivist from um, uh, uh, Rutgers, right? That's your affiliation. Uh, uh, Fernanda Perone who is here tonight and is going to have a bit of a conversation after Barbara's show and tell of her, her photographs. Uh, and uh, we'll invite your questions at, at that time too. So it's really a pleasure to be able to introduce uh, Barbara Mensch again, um, a good friend of the museum and uh, certainly um, a, a, an extraordinary historian herself through, as she was ex just explaining, her own life, her own um, work um, present in Lower Manhattan. So, Barbara. Okay. Thank you.